Well, it is such a pleasure to be together this evening and a joy for me to welcome you to our Hanging of the Greens service. Every year we gather this way on the first Sunday evening in Advent. And we, uh, we gather with families and we gather as a family. And it just seems the most fitting kind of way for us to kick off a beautiful time together. So thank you for your presence with us and for all of the contributions that you'll make to our uh, worship and fellowship this evening. Uh, the uh, different parts that we will play, uh, the embodying of the story that we will do collectively, and your participation uh, with us this evening. For the worship that's, that's here now and for the time of fellowship afterwards, uh, the refreshments in the fellowship hall, we hope everyone will partake fully and joyfully and indeed that this will be a great and wonderful gift to you as we are a gift to each other. Thank you for being here and welcome. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every munch low. The uneven ground shall be become leveled and the rough plains places a plain. And the Lord, and the Lord shall be revealed, and the people shall seek together. Let us join in prayer. Most holy and gracious God, we thank you for the promise of your love. Come to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we ask now for Christ's Spirit to be with us, to dwell with us, and to, to lead us in this time of worship, drawing us deeper into the story of your great love for us. May this time bring glory to you and deep blessing to us. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
One of our, one of our Christian writers, Eugene Peterson, wrote, We live in narrative. We live in story. Existence has a story shape to it. We have a beginning and an end. We have a plot. We have characters. The crush for us is the visual aid of the greatest story ever told. Tonight, as the scene of God's amazing plot is being presented and displayed in a place of prominence here in the sanctuary, we are all invited to peer into the cramped stable, looking in on all the characters of the holy narrative that are so familiar from the gospel readings. In thoughtful arrangement are the figurines of the tired but serene Mary and her husband. We see the shepherds up from the field, the array of animals standing quietly in reverence, and the three kings carrying their expensive gifts. And at the center of everyone's focus is the manger, a rough makeshift crib. And in it, the smallest figurine of them all, the baby Jesus. The God that humbled himself to come among us. The nativity scene is much more than a cute collectible or an heirloom. It's worth much more than the porcelain, paint, and glue it took the artist to make. The creche is priceless in the way it puts faces with the living world. It's a powerful teaching tool to explain to young children the birth of Jesus. And the creche for all adults throws light on a holy night. The standing reminder of a humble beginning of a glorious Messiah.
prophet Isaiah invites us to celebrate the brightness of God's design and anticipate the coming of the Christ child when he announces, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Throughout scripture, the image of light permeates the history of our faith. It is the light that God first created and called good. By the brightness of the burning bush, Moses was called to lead Israel. A guiding star led wise men to a manger in the backwoods of Bethlehem. And because of a blinding light, a hateful Saul became the Apostle Paul. Light symbolizes goodness, truth, life, love, and wisdom. The opposite of darkness, ignorance, death, and sin. Tonight we recognize God as the creator of light and Jesus as the giver of that light. And together we live in knowledge that we are called to be committed keepers of this light. Tradition lets us know that long before Christians began to celebrate Christmas as the day of Jesus' birth, a candle was used to signify Christ as the light of the world. The story goes that Martin Luther, one of the first to use the Christmas tree, was said to have been so moved by the brightness of the stars shining through the snow, covered branches of the evergreens around him, that he put candles on a tree and set it up in his home. In that spirit, we will bring light to our trees and candles to our windows. As the sanctuary fills with their glowing, we remember Christ's announcement and promise. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12.
The beautiful plant we have come to enjoy as the poinsettia has a wonderful story attached to it that's worth repeating. Almost 200 years ago, poinsettia, poinsettias were wildflowers that grew out in the Mexican countryside. One day, the United States ambassador to Mexico was out for a walk, and he was fascinated with his discovery of these bright red flowers. Fire flowers, the, Mex the Mexicans called them. With closer in inspection, the ambassador found that what he wasn't admiring wasn't a flower, but a plant. The ambassador liked the plant so much that when he got home to America, Greenville, South Carolina, to be exact, he took some of the plants with him to grow. And fancying himself to be quite the horticulturalist, the retired politician grew many of the plants. The ambassador's name? Joel Roberts Poinsett. For us to take home a little background of how the poinsettia becomes such a beautiful Christmas tradition, we turn again to Ambassador Poinsett. Along with the native Mexican plants he took to Greenville, Ambassador Poinsett brought home a story, a legend about the plants. The legend tells of a little Mexican girl named Lucida who every year on Christmas Eve, all of the folks of her village brought gifts to offer the Christ child. Children understood this to be a celebration of Jesus' Jesus's birthday. Well, one Christmas Eve, Lucida didn't have a gift to bring, and it made her sad. She told everyone she didn't want to go to the church and celebrate Jesus' birthday. A wise old woman came up to Lucida, Lucida and told her it didn't matter what kind of gift she brought to lay the before the manger. Any gift that was given from the heart is a special gift, the woman said. So Lucida went to pick the flowers that were growing outside the church steps and went inside and laid them in front of the manger. As she did, legend has it that each weed began to change colors until all of the green leaves had become bright red leaves. Her simple gift had become something beautiful. When the townspeople went outside, they were surprised to see that all the clumps of green weeds had turned into shining red flowers. And at Christmas time, every year since then, the red leaves shine on top of the green branches of the poinsettia. As we fill the chancel with poinsettias, the colors of the season found at the poinsettias come to mind. The rich reds and greens and golden yellows that symbolize the royalty, everlasting life, and authority that Christ brings into the world.
the Greens. In pre-Christian times, the winners of athletic competitions and the victors in military conquest wore crowns made of green laurel. With the beginning of the first church, Christians adopted the greenery as trophy idea as their own. Families hung lush branches on their doorposts to signify the great and enduring victory that Jesus brings over the powers of death and darkness. During their time, the laurels were used as decorations during both Advent and Lent seasons, commemorating the Messiah's birth and resurrection. The evergreens that we hang tonight echo the early Christians' faith. Listen for the images of authority and victory from Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Now we come to the part in our service where we focus on decorating our chrismon trees. Did you know that the word chrismon really is the combination of two words, Christ and monogram? A Christmas tree is just that, a monogram of Christ, a representation of all that Christ is. The green trees themselves have always stood for the everlasting, evergreen life we know and experience through Jesus Christ. As a congregation comes forward to decorate, notice that the decorations are not candy canes or little summer Santa ornaments. No, the handmade decorations that will fill the branches really have nothing to do with the commercialized Christmas but everything to do with the symbols and meanings of faith. Along with the crosses, which to me are self-explanatory, look for the five-point star that gets hung on the branches. This ornament represents the star that lit up that Bethlehem night. The crown ornaments echo the statement that Jesus is the true King of Kings, Lord of Law. The butterflies that we will see symbolize Christ's resurrection. Knowing that butterflies emerge from seemingly lifeless cocoons to soar into the sky on strong, colorful wings 
is like understanding that those that pass away live again in eternity with God. And as the fish ornaments are being placed, we can reflect on the Greek word ixthus. Ixthus really can be translated as an acronym, each letter of the word standing for other different words. Break, broken down lichthus means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. With the threat of persecution, early Christians used the fish symbol as a, as a secret way to speak, make easy to make clue to six signify that they were followers of Jesus. The cross. Finally, we focus on the cross. If we were making a film about Christ's story tonight, 
we have focused our lights and camera and backdrops and soundtrack, if you will, around the celebration of a very unique experience that split time itself. Our field of vision has gone from close up to close up. We've heard about the light Jesus brought in, in with him into the world. Then the story about the bright poinsettias, the lush meaning of greenery, the symbolism behind the Christ, the Christmas ornaments and the trees. And now our camera lens have instructions to pull back, giving a wide view of what tonight means. The big picture is that just five miles from Bethlehem, where a young, tired Mary gave birth to a son of God, there were there are the hills of Jerusalem where 33 years later an angry crowd hung Christ out to dry, nailed to a criminal's cross. Did you know that on a clear day with optimum conditions you could stand on the streets of Bethlehem and make out the hills of Jerusalem. As we listen to the wonderful melodies and reflective lyrics of going to Bethlehem, we will take the gifts first placed at the manger to the foot of the cross. I invite you to remember the awesome, unmatched, ultimate gift of Jesus Christ who gave his life for you and me so that we could all enjoy the gift that is eternal to him. As John 3.16 <coughs> reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved.
true are we, Lord God, that you should come to us. As we prepare to celebrate his birth, make our hearts leap for joy at the sound of your word and move us by your spirit to bless your wonderful works. Well, many thanks again to everyone who made this such a special, special service, a great way to begin our Advent season. And I'd like again to invite everyone to come to the Fellowship Hall afterwards for some punch and some cookies and for some good time with our church family and friends. Now, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>